Hello, welcome. I'm just gonna give it a couple of minutes just for folks to log in and to catch up because we um, took it out of the Zoom and then logged back in. So if you guys could just probably give five minutes and then we'll get started. Hi, Brother Sawazi. All right. Welcome to those who just entered. We're just uh, waiting a couple more minutes, so about three more minutes, and then we'll get started to see if anyone else pops on. Thank you for joining us. All right, y'all, thank you so much for joining. It's about 6.09, so I mean, it's pretty much pretty much 6.10. <laughs> um, peace and blessings and welcome to the Use What You Got to Grow What You Want introductory workshop. Um, it's the first workshop of five uh, put on by Fat Crops, I Am Green, San Diego River Valley Conservancy, um, and their Next to Nature um, series, and the San Diego Gas and Electric Company's Environmental Champions um, grant. Before we get started in tonight's introductory workshop, there's just a few things I kind of wanted to cover and like just mention. Um, first off, 
obviously check out the next four workshops in the series, um, companion planting, which will take place on January 18th, um, troubleshooting pests and problems on February 1st, regrowing food from your kitchen scraps on February 15th, and then a celebratory event with a plot to plate cooking demo uh, put on by Vevi Eats, um, and that will be March 1st. Uh, secondly, um, if you're joining us virtually, well, at this point, everyone's just uh, joining us virtually. So if you could just drop, drop your name in the chat. Um, and if you would prefer to send it like um, private message, chat, that's okay as well. We just want to kind of have a, um, a name and possibly an email where we can send out an email update for the next four workshops. If you're interested, we'll be doing a registration um, because I think at this point the event is hybrid, but we are going to be actually transitioning into a fully online event for the next four events moving forward. Um, so we really want to be able to make sure to communicate with you all so that you don't miss the next couple of workshops. Um, and then lastly, um, I just think that it's kind of important to articulate that this workshop doesn't um, attempt to cover everything about the topics that we talk about, just because that would be very expansive. Um, but we do just really hope to provide an introduction into different things, um, different topics around growing our own food, around food sustainability and food sovereignty food justice, environmental justice, and um, and the like. So um, without further ado, I would like to share screen with y'all. Loading. <clears throat> All right, so again, welcome to Use What You Got to Grow What You Want. Um, this is actually an introductory workshop. Today is January 4th, 2022. And your uh, workshop today is being brought to you by San Dieguito River Valley Conservancy, Next to Nature, San Diego Gas and Electric, Fat Crops, and I Am Green. So how our journey began, this is kind of just a lot of times people ask uh, to know a little bit about me and like how I got started in gardening. So this is me I threw in these photos um, because it kind of just gives a little bit of background into how I was raised. Um, I'm a mud baby. My mom let me run around <laughs> like in nature all the time. And she taught me to have a profound respect for um, animals and plants around me and for the earth. And so that love and respect turned into um, like a lifelong passion. Um, and then uh, let's see, in terms of gardening and growing, actually, when I was younger, I swore I would never have any plants because my mom had so many. Um, but then as I became an adult, I got much into having small plants around. And then um, like when topics of like racial injustice started to come into my education, I started to learn more about like food sovereignty. And that's when it came to my mind to start to try to grow our own food. Um, and we started growing on a tabletop in our kitchen right next to a window in Denver, Colorado, where we hardly got any sun. Um, and then when we moved back to San Diego, we grew in a small corner in our kitchen in a small corner of our um, like stairway in a small apartment. So um, that's actually how Use What You Got to Grow What You Want came about is the conversation um, with Sister Maria Mohammed of I Am Green about how to start to grow your own food, but starting where you are with limited resources, limited space, limited time, et cetera. Um, so I 
started growing more food than I was growing in my home when I first started at Mount Hope Community Garden. I then later became a climate ambassador for environmental justice. And through that program, um, got into the idea of creating fat crops as, as an entity, as what it is now. Um, and then through I Am Green, we met San Diego River Valley Conservancy, who then um, wanted to partner for this workshop series and um, the rest is kind of history. So um, let's see, we'll move forward here. Uh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> okay, so um, usually when I talk to folks about like gardening and growing their own food, Everyone always says like, I wish I could have a garden or I wish I could grow my own food. And I always ask like, why not? And the four main reasons that I usually get are one, they don't have enough space. Land is difficult to come by. Not everyone has enough land in, and in their mind to grow food, to grow enough food to feed your family, you need acres of land. Secondly is I don't have enough time. Um, watering and pruning and taking care of these plants takes a lot of time. And so I don't have enough time. The third thing I hear is I don't have enough money. It costs money to buy seeds and pots and all of these different fertilizers and soils and money to build trellises and these things. So I don't have enough money. And then the fourth thing that I hear most commonly is I don't have a green thumb. Well, I'm here to say that I don't have a green thumb either. And actually, when I first started growing things, I killed a lot of things. I still kill things today. Um, it just took me a little while to decide that I wanted to put, put like a little bit more focus into learning how those things that I wanted to plant grew in a way that reduced the waste of it pretty much. Um, when I first started growing, I would literally take seeds and just like throw them into the garden and be like, grow for me. And then I would dance and sing and play music <laughs> and water them. And then they'd grow. And so people would always be like, how do you get your stuff to grow? And that was my answer. And it was a bad answer <laughs> because people wanted to replicate that. So I kind of just decided to put some time into learning how these things grow and how they grow uh, more efficiently and in ways that can actually feed yourself, your family, your community, et cetera. So um, that's kind of where we went from that. Um, and then I kind of, my permaculture design teacher, Josh Robinson, he says um, actually to move your mindset from a poverty mindset to an abundance mindset. And so basically what he means by that is not to foot war or how I take that is let's not focus on what we don't have, but instead let's focus on what we do have. So when we talk about space and land, um, you know, it, it doesn't take acres and acres to grow food. You can actually grow in very small spaces. As I mentioned before, I grew, um, my sisters and I, we lived in a small apartment when we moved to Colorado. We grew food in our kitchen on the table. And then we later, we designated a corner where we bought a a tower garden and we had that corner growing and we had some uh, containers out on our patio in this sliver of stairway that got sun and we had some windowsill plants but needless to say you really don't need a lot of space all you need is creativity um when it comes to time there is some time that you invest in one learning you know how to get your plants to grow efficiently and two planning what plants do i want to grow especially when you're growing food you want to grow in your home the foods that you're going to eat instead of growing foods that you're not going to eat because then you're going to have waste so just putting a little thought and time into planning what you want to grow what you'll actually eat and how you'll use those things that you grow um, just a little bit of fore planning and time in, in advance will actually save you tons of time in health, in going to the grocery store, in shopping for produce. Um, I remember a couple years back, some folks were like on Facebook, on, on social media, and they're going crazy like, oh my gosh, like there's no collard greens. It's about to be some, some holiday, whatever. There's no collard greens in the store. And they're going crazy. And I was like, 
if anyone needs some extra collard greens, we got some growing in the garden and like they're, they're really big and beautiful. Um, but like, rather than spending the time going from store to store to store on a hunt, looking for collard greens, I like could walk, like go straight into my garden and now I can harvest my collard greens. So you actually save lots of time. And that also kind of segues into the next one, which you will save tons of money in health related issues and money in buying produce from the store. Growing at home allows you to control what goes into your produce so you can actually be buying or growing organically um, and not having to pay that extra cost for organic foods, not having to pay the extra cost if you live in a food desert to travel outside of your zone or your region in order to purchase these foods from other stores. Um, so for those of us who, you know, or, or for those of y'all who live in Southeast and there's not a, a healthy grocery store within 10 miles uh, and the farmer's market closed down, um, you know, this will save you from having to drive all the way into Lemon Grove to go to Sprouts or driving to Palm to go to um, a Northgate. So you will end up saving time and money. Now with the other aspect with money is it costs a lot of money to buy all these big rigs, these nice fancy hydro systems. And really when it comes down to it, it doesn't. Seeds are inexpensive, but the trick is actually what I found out during my um, master's program is, is that you can purchase edible plants on with your EBT card. And so for folks who are short on money, folks who um, who receive like uh, welfare benefits or, or food stamps benefits, you can purchase food plants with your benefits that continue to go. <clears throat> excuse me, they can continue to reproduce that plant at least two, maybe three, four cycles if you continue to um, water it or take care of it, etc. cetera. <clears throat> excuse me. You can also recycle seeds. You could do seed swaps, which takes down your cost. <clears throat> Once you start growing, then you can get into harvesting your seeds and drying your seeds, which will allow you to uh, reproduce excuse me, <clears throat> when you start drying and um, saving your seeds, you can reproduce them and then you don't have to buy them anymore. <clears throat> Sorry, give me one moment. Um, and then, so there's many ways that you can cut costs um, when it comes to building like hydroponics or aer um, aeroponic systems. You can actually <clears throat> purchase really inexpensive PVC piping. You can utilize so, so many different things that you can recycle from junk junkyards, from recycling things, uh, recycling old, old containers that you have. You don't have to go and buy expensive containers or pots, planter boxes or raised beds that are built. Um, you actually can recycle these things or recycle other things. Um, in terms of container growing, um, Erica Badu actually recycled some old porcelain tubs and she uses those as raised beds. So um, that just goes to show that you can use anything. It just takes a little bit of creativity. And then again, um, I don't have a green thumb, so we can all do it. <clears throat> so one of the things I mentioned was if you're low, like if you have a, a pretty limited budget and you want to grow food, other than growing from seed, you can regrow from your food scraps. When we talk about thinking of what we have and what we don't have, we may not have the money to go out and buy the seeds or a plant, but we do have food. We have to eat. So at some point we'll have food. And if we just get a little creative, we can actually regrow lots of things from food scraps. 
here you can see um, in the top picture, they cut open um, a tomato. Now, maybe this tomato had been just sitting on your um, counter or in your refrigerator for a couple of days and it's soft. And maybe you don't want to cut it and put it on a sandwich. Maybe it just looks a little, a little less than uh, appetizing, right? Maybe a little yellow spot on there. A lot of times we waste food that we think is not good, but it is, it's actually good and still edible. But more than that, it's recyclable. <clears throat> We, um, in the United States, we have one of the highest waste, pollution waste amounts uh, and, and food waste amounts uh, of pretty much any developing nation, quote unquote developing nation. So here also in the left-hand picture, you can see there's celery, beets, carrots, onions, green onions, shallots, um, potatoes, sweet potatoes, mint. Um, <clears throat> there's just so many things that you can regrow from your kitchen scraps. You might have left the potato on, a, you know, in a bag for a little while and then notice that there's little green shoots coming out of it. That potato is growing. You can actually cut it in half or cut it in multiple sections if the, if the tubers are growing or if new sprouts are growing out of the tuber. And plant that into the ground and it will grow and it will grow into a whole potato and it will actually grow more potatoes. Um, so I remember at Mount Hope to start my first potatoes, I went across the street to a market, bought an organic um, russet potato and an organic red potato. I cut it with a pocket knife and I put it in the ground. I said, let's see if this grows and it, and it grew. And then like um, one of the, um, one of my mentors, Kudumu at the garden, he had some sweet potatoes growing. I said, let me get one of those. He gave me one. I put it in, I cut it in threes. I put it in the ground and it grew and it ended up turning into sweet potatoes for a really long time. Um, so you can stretch your dollar to actually grow on a limited budget. <clears throat> Um, as I mentioned before, you don't have to have a lot of space. This picture in the left, this is Erica Badu. She grows in her, in some bathtubs. It's so amazing because literally all you need is something that can hold water or soil. You can grow in water and you can grow in soil. I wanted to add a picture to this earlier, but I didn't get a chance. And, there, and it was actually a man, um, an elderly man in Asia who planted lettuce seeds into the cracks of the concrete. Now imagine you're walking down the concrete and you have these little cracks and you remember we used to jump over them and say like, you know, jump on the crack, whatever. In those little cracks, he sowed lettuce seeds. And so these huge heads of lettuce would grow up from these concrete, the cracks in the concrete. And he would just come through with a knife and harvest each of them off and then regrow into these little tiny cracks with just a tiny bit of dirt, soil. and and it wasn't soil, it was dirt. Um, and my permaculture design teacher will say, dirt is just soil devoid of the, nu devoid of the nutrients. So, um, and, and most, mostly it's moisture. <clears throat> so anyways, you can grow literally anywhere where you can store the smallest amount of dirt, hopefully soil so that it's, it has you know, nutrients ready for the plant, but soil or water. Um, up here, you'll see just a small like class project, kids growing in some little um, cups, little plastic cups. Um, you can see here, someone got really creative and created some planter box in limited space, looks like a balcony. Um, and they just did like a vertical garden with some herbs. Um, <clears throat> so this is all limited space or in the picture with the garden, but I mean, with the bathtubs, it's not limited space, but the container method was ingenious, in my opinion. So this is me and our tower garden. Um, as I mentioned before, we just had a small corner in our kitchen um, by the only, like one of the only windows that got light. Um, and we put, uh, we put up this tower garden. This tower garden works on a, a hydroponic system. Basically the water pumps from the bottom basin and to the top and then um, works through a drip system, drips down into these net pots and the, um, the food products grow. We had Swiss chard and lettuce and a bunch of things growing here and, and they were beautiful and they were really great. Um, and you can you know use these systems with lights or without lights. 
um, the lights help with the indoor growing, but once they get really long can actually start to burn your um, produce. So that, that's, you know, it takes a little trial and error just to get used to. Also things that I mentioned in terms of like space saving or um, even time saving and money saving. On the left, you'll see this is um, actually um, an aquaponics setup. And so in the top, you have a hydroponic set that's growing lettuce. You can grow all types of things in a hydroponic set, so it doesn't necessarily have to be lettuce. And this has a filter and a pump, and basically it cycles water from a, another tank that has fish. I've seen people do it with fish, and I, I've seen them do it with a, a few other aquatic animals. Um, and so pretty much just like the poop and, and stuff from the fish um, feeds the plants and vice versa. Um, and the plant and the fish clean the water from the plants. Um, so this is a system that actually is, is really works really well. People use it in all types of places um, and can be done with limited resources, like with some PVC pipes and like some tanks really um, of some glass. So on the right-hand side, you have a setup. This is actually pretty um, intricate setup, but they had limited space. And so they built up a wall and this is just some piping and they cut holes in it and stuck some small pots in there. And they likely have a system that pumps water and then it trickles through and each of the plants somehow um, <clears throat> through well because the plants are very very smart and their root systems will go into these pipes and and they usually grow down into the pipes the way that you can see here in the hydroponic tank and then they soak up water they tap into the water and that's how they feed themselves so there's so many different ways that you can grow with limited space limited money limited land etc so just a few other things to consider when you want to start growing your own food, companion planting. Um, so obviously there are some plants that are good to grow next to others and some plants that are horrible to grow next to others. Um, there is a link here to like the almanac guide of companion planting. But if you want to get more into talking about companion planting, we will have a Fat Crop Sand, San Diego, and I Am Green. Uh, part of this workshop series on January 18th, we're doing um, the companion planting workshop uh, where we will actually talk about companion planting a little bit differently. We want to talk about um, what, so companion planting in, in, in the terms of like beneficial plants that can either uh, provide support. So whether these are nitrogen fix, fixing plants that actually fix nitrogen into the soil and they actually help to build up the soil for other plants to grow. Um, there are plants that actually have large tap roots that go deep into the soil and they help to kind of hold everything in for other plants that grow. There are plants that um, actually deter pests that are um, like common to certain other plants. And so you can, um, you can actually control your pests that eat up your um, specific plants by planting other plants next to it that those pests hate or that kill those pests. Um, and then there's also sacrificial plants that are, those are plants that bugs, some bugs or pests prefer and will go for over your food plants, your edibles. And so they are planted there literally just to draw the pests away from your food plants. Um, so that's another way that companion planting can be looked at. Um, I think when you kind of just Google companion planting, people say like plant beans and corn and squash together because of the support aspect. <clears throat> We're growing um, trellising plants or vining plants with sturdy stock plants or trees and things like that. That's, that's a for support, uh, more for support than for uh, like soil building or for pest control. So there's multiple ways you can actually look at companion planting and um, like plant things close enough by that are gonna help um, 
pretty much stack some functions for you, whether that be pest control and building into the soil or, um, or pest control and supportive um, structures, et cetera. Um, let's see. Then you have planting and harvesting guides. That's the zones and the seasons. So you may be interested in this and you may not be. Um, I don't put a lot of emphasis in this actually because we live in sunny San Diego where weather is almost always perfect. It's been really cold lately, <laughs> but weather is usually pretty mild here. We're um, like where we're located. We don't have fluctuations in our, um, in our planting seasons the way that some other places might. Like we don't have a frost season. Um, it, it gets pretty cold, but for the most part, um, a lot of food items can withstand that. Um, there are some things that like lettuces and, and um, softer leaf plants that, and especially like uh, starters and like seedlings that folks will move in house or into a greenhouse. Um, or even like build a like a root cellar sort of system over in order to protect from the cold cold weather um, when they're vulnerable. But once they get established, they're us usually able to make it through our winter here in San Diego. Um, but if you live elsewhere, you may want to take some time to learn about the your specific zone, or if you plan to move, check out you know this link to the plant hardiness by USDA and you could get some information about the different zones and about the seasons um, associated with those zones. They give you um, planting guides and harvesting guides, when to plant what and when to harvest them. Uh, additionally, you may want to spend some time learning about soil, water and fertilizers, um, the nutrients, um, some uh, like the, the potassium and um, like it's the NPKs pretty much. You wanna wanna know what that is and um, how to check for those in your soil or how to adjust those in your soil um, so that your soil it provides the best home for your plants. Um, now plants, as I mentioned before with the cracks in the concrete, the, many plants will grow in the worst conditions, but if you want to maximize your production and minimize your waste, um, then it benefits you to learn how to um, maximize your production. And that, and that main thing coming from that is making sure that your soil is, um, is great soil. It's full of nutrients and biodiversity and, um, it, you know, that it's the type of soil that, that your plant likes. Uh, for instance, if you have a plant that doesn't prefer a lots of water, you make sure that your soil is very, um, like has um, something in it to help for drainage, whether that's rocks or like extra prolite, um, et cetera. You wanna make sure that it, it's going to provide the drainage that your plant needs to not die from root rot. Or, you know, so, this is just for example. Um, and then the last thing is pests and problems. So um, obviously growing your own garden, you're gonna come across some quote unquote pests. I say quote unquote because uh, pests and weeds are something to me that um, it depends on the person you're asking. Some people will say that's a pest and some people will say what well, kind of looks, it depends on how you look at it, right? Um, and then same thing with weeds, what is a weed? to one person may be actually medicinal to another person. Um, for example, the dandelion, most people think that that's a weed and they wanna cut it out. Mallow, same thing. Those things are great medicinal herbs and they actually are have tons of properties uh, for food and for medicine. So what's a weed to one person is medicine to another person. What is a pest to one person can actually be very beneficial or is actually not too big of a problem for another person. At my previous garden at Mount Hope, I didn't do anything to control for pests um, except one time. And that was because my original thought was, this isn't my plot, like even though it's my plot, it's not really my plot, right? It's out in nature. And so the pests, if they come, if the butterflies come and they bring caterpillars or if this, Hornworm is eating up my tomatoes, then like I got to share, right? Because it's not mine. 
And, and that's gravy too, if you feel that way. Um, but when you finally, you know, when you grow something and you spend a lot of time in it and you're very happy, and then you finally get those beautiful black tomatoes and you find that there's hornworms all over just devastating it you're gonna want to do something um so the one time i did choose to do something what i did was bought some beneficial bugs and so um while someone would say oh you have pests no i have food for these other bugs that i'm gonna bring in right now these predatory bugs so i did a praying mantis i did some ladybugs and um released them into the to the area and it, and it was really cool and it gave me an opportunity to talk to the youth about something um within the life cycle and it was really cool um so if you want to learn more about pests and problems um we'll talk about natural remedies um that don't include pesticides um we will we will turn off annotation for those who don't I want to turn that off. Yeah, sorry about that, Al. So um, <clears throat> we'll talk about natural remedies that are not pesticides. We'll talk about um, using like neem oil, um, some types of soap. Like I've I've actually made a pesticide kind of soap with uh, some Dr. Bronner's and some apple cider vinegar and some hot peppers. I remember once I boiled these hot peppers, habaneros into my, in my kitchen and my sisters were all mad, like it stinks in the house, it stinks. And I'm like, I'm making this natural, natural uh, pesticide, hopefully it works, right? But it smelled horrible, but um, it actually kept a lot of pests away. Um, but, but be careful with those things because I remember we sprayed excuse me, sprayed a couple of things with it. And for like probably two years after the aloe that we had, had a spicy flavor to it. <clears throat> it was so weird because we grow a lot of aloe and we use it for like cuts and things, but it was burning. <laughs> and then when you taste it, it has spicy, it had a spicy habanero flavor to it. So um, if you'd like to learn more about pests and problems, you can join us on February 1st for the workshop, 99 Problems, But a Pest Ain't One. And let's see. So here we just have some images of my raised bed plots that we used to have at Mount Hope, um, at Mount Hope Community Garden. To the left, this picture on the left-hand side, this was actually our melon plot. It started out as a plot full of strawberries. We pulled the strawberries, but the strawberries just kept coming back. Um, but here you can see we have some watermelon growing, some cantaloupe. Um, we had a few different types of melons growing in this plot. It was beautiful. Um, and actually, if you look right in the corner of this, you can see some little cheap uh, laundry baskets. We grew the sweet potatoes in those laundry baskets. So um, I remember when I first got the one sweet potato from uh, my mentor and he and I'm like, what am I going to grow it in? I don't have one of those fancy potato bags. And he goes, fancy potato bag, like go to the 99 cent store, get you a laundry basket, get some newspaper and then put it in there. And I was like, what? And he's like, yeah. And so I went to the 99 cent store and I bought two plastic uh, bag, uh, baskets <clears throat> went and instead of buying a paper, I went and grabbed a reader and I ripped up the paper and I lined the inside of the basket with the paper and I put soil inside and I put the sweet potato pieces in one and I put the potatoes, the rusted potato and the red potato in the other. And sure and bold, it grew and I had tons of potatoes growing. And then if you actually look in this second photo here, this is my greens plot. Um, we had a moringa tree. We had collard green trees. These collard green trees actually were moved from a previous plot we had to this side. And each of these would grow up to about eight feet. And I started off with one, one of these. And what I did was I, I waited till it grew up and was doing really well when it was happy. And I propagated it by cutting off some of the shoots that came off the sides. 
and replanting those. So as you can see, there's some smaller ones down here. These are all propagates of one plant that I had. So I turned one plant into many. By the time I came out of Mount Hope, I had about eight, maybe nine, seven foot tall collard trees. Um, down at the bottom here, these were kale. We had some lacinto kale and some curly kale. We also had some onions growing in there. Um, in the pots, we had some calendula um, because I do some stuff with herbalism. We had some, oh, these are the sweet potatoes here that were transferred from these little baskets later into a tarp bag that opened up from the bottom to harvest potatoes. Um, and then going forward, there was some watermelon and there was um, another potato in this bag. And then there was some black tomatoes growing at the end by the Moringa tree. And on the right hand side, this was our three sisters plot. You can see the corn growing here in the back, these stalks, um, and then the squash and beans that proliferated this plot. They completely took over. Um, I had a really good luck with the squash and beans. Um, in the front here, you can see some beans coming up these little wooden stakes and there were some small trellises in there. And we got huge squash, huge. Um, but the corn did not fare too well. I believe it was because I didn't plant enough of them in the row for them to cross pollinate. But when I started to get corn stalks come in, the kernels would be missing. So there would be a couple and then a couple missing. So, but they were beautiful blue corn. And so I was very excited about it, but eventually I ended up chopping the corn down and this became the two sisters plot. Um, and then I, out of lack of space, <laughs> threw my banana trees in there. So if you see in this middle plot, you see right here in this corner, there are some banana trees. Those are actually my banana trees from the three sisters plot that became the two and a half sisters plot. So it went from corn, bean and squash, which are, uh, they're called the three sisters because they provide support for one another. This is actually indigenous knowledge. Um, they would plant them together so that the corn stalks would be stabilizing support for the squash and the beans that trellis. <clears throat> um, but again, my corn didn't fare too well, so we took it out and <laughs> we added in bananas. And when we added the bananas in, we added just two banana trees and then they ended up turning into 13 banana trees. Um, and at one point I found some yams growing underneath my banana roots which blew me away. It was like the coolest thing ever, but I'm not gonna go into that. Um, some other things that we've grown, pretty much these are our sweet potatoes that were growing in some tarp bags. Um, this was watermelon also growing in a tarp bag. We had cauliflower, we had broccoli growing um, in, in a very small, actually a very small triangle with some bark, uh, with some wood chips um, and they grew and it grew very well. And then a couple of harvest photos. Uh, these are the squash, <laughs> these are the squash that were coming out. Like they were huge squash coming out of those plants there. So we had some black tomatoes, some zucchini and some squash, some beautiful collard greens, some curly kale. Um, we had some, regular tomatoes and cherry tomatoes at some point, some green beans. We actually had purple green beans as well. Mint growing like crazy. And then these are a couple of potatoes that grew from my original potato that I bought from the liquor store. It was a, it's a food market liquor store, but literally one potato from a liquor store cut, turned into a, a harvest of potatoes. And then this is me, um, me with a beautiful head of broccoli that I grew. This actually, um, I used to teach and at a school, I um, installed a garden into a school that I was teaching at a small charter school. And we started planting a couple of students and me started planting some things. Um, we went away for winter break and came back and this broccoli was just so beautiful. Um, it was amazing. Um, the middle picture, these are the collard trees I was speaking of. Beautiful, large collards. As you see, there's no holes. Like when you go to the grocery store, they're kind of a little beat up. No, these collard greens were beautiful um, and organic. 
In this right-hand top photo, these are some bananas that were grown at the garden. Um, these were the bananas actually on the stock and right below it were the bananas once they were harvested off the stock. Sorry about that, y'all. This thing is going too fast. Okay, and then the picture to the left on the bottom, those actually show my banana trees when we first got them. They were so tiny and they were literally just three little new babies that were given to us from um, another Mount Hope community garden member. And we moved them into this circle area. I thought it was beautiful. The stones made a beautiful circle area, um, but the bananas did not like the soil in there. So they didn't grow. Um, but once I moved them, they grew abundantly. And as you've seen from a previous photo with my plot, they got really big. Um, and then in the middle, this is me actually clearing another garden area we were working on on 47th and Castana. Um, so thank you so much for your time and for your attention. And let's now, let's use our creativity to find ways to grow uh, what we want using what we actually have. Um, whether that's limited space, limited time, limited money, um, or limited knowledge or understanding about growing, um, we can make it work. And there are people out there that are willing to help as well. So if you've ever wanted to start a garden or grow your own food, today is the day to start. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop sharing now. And then we'll come back. We just have a little bit about nine minutes. And so if there's any questions that anyone has, um, I am more than welcome to, uh, I mean, you're more than welcome to ask those. Oh, I see, okay. So there's a couple of questions also in the chat, but um, someone asked if you have, if you need help getting rid of a rat. So, um, for larger pests like rodents and things of that sort, my suggestion is to let nature like replicate itself. Like I'm really big on trying to really do what, what nature does on its own. Um, so like I mentioned before about the predatory pests, um, they're there to take care of those. It's the cycle of life. So um, praying mantises eat bugs that eat your plants. So introducing the praying mantis into your garden will lower your pests, right? Um, although paying mantises are not a sure way of getting rid of just your pests because they'll also eat your beneficial bugs. Um, but if you have a rat problem, if you want to avoid like rat poisonings and things like that, that can get really um, dangerous and, and, you know, things like that, I would get a cat. I have a cat. I love my cat. Um, but I don't very much like when he brings things home to me. Um, that's really not my favorite thing at all. He comes to the door and he knows how to open our back screen. So if we don't have the glass closed, he'll bring in lizards and mice and whatever he can find um, and he'll bring it in the door. So, but if you not, if you're not allergic to cats and you're not opposed to having your cat go hunting, then cats are a very good way of keeping down rodent problems. Um, in my opinion. Um, otherwise, you can probably reach out to like your city animal control or pest control companies and they do traps and things like that. Um, I don't know of any, but it would be awesome if somebody else knew of like a, like a removal system that comes in and humanely removes them the way they do bees. Um, but I don't think so. So I don't know. But if somebody knows of like a rat removal that comes in and move, removes rats without hurting them, that would be nice. Uh, and please share that if you know that in the chat. Um, if anyone else has any questions, you can put them in the chat or you can. My bad, y'all. Um, you can also unmute yourself and just ask the question too. All right, so we got about six minutes left and it seems that there are no questions. I have a question. Okay. It sounds right. like nephew. Is that you? Uh, TT, I have a question. Uh, so, what was your favorite process process out of growing these things? Cause I I have a plant over here, and the plant's pretty nice, and I like it. So, like, what was your favorite process growing all these plants out? 
you're right. You do have a plant. You actually have a few plants and they're amazing and they're like growing so big. And I'm very proud of you for how you've taken care of them. And remember in the beginning, when you started to grow them, I was very excited to show you when the seeds sprout. That's my favorite part. It's so cool to see the seed break open and something totally different come from like, I'm always like, that was inside of there. And so when I see the seed break and the first start of growth come through, that's when I get very, very excited. Like it's a lie. It's like a birth to me. And I'm also a doula. So that's the birth process. It's beautiful. Whether it's a plant coming through or human life um, is very beautiful to me. So I love that part. And also I like the part when you actually get fruit or vegetables from it and that I can bring home to my family. So that's, those are my two favorite parts. Did you have a favorite part music? Yeah, I really like the part where I get to see them, uh, the growth every single day. And uh, yeah, I really like the growth. Right on. I'm proud of you for, for picking up the gardening and food growing. Are there any Thank other you. questions? Oh, of course. So what are, what are some quick tips to get started? Let's say if someone were to go out tomorrow, the, what kind of things would they need to start something small? Good question. Um, so if you wanted to get started tomorrow, we've been getting some good rain, but it's kind of chilly. So I would probably start your seeds indoors if you start from seed. If you want to skip the seed process, which some people want to skip the seed process, and I totally respect that. Um, I like the seed process because it's like you're literally germinating from the beginning. Um, and it's a whole thing that you get to see. And, and it's really cool for me. Um, but if you grab a starter plant, um, starters come in like four packs, six packs, you can get them in one plant. You can have some friends um, who grow and you can just ask them like, hey, do you have any cuttings for me? Um, and you can actually minimize your costs by doing that, you know, um, maybe your neighbor grows something or your cousin down the way, they grow something. You could just say, hey, do you have any cuttings or anything you can propagate for me? And um, and you can just get started some, you know, whether you want to do seeds or starters or cuttings, that's like the main thing. So just to get started, I would uh, first I would get a piece of paper and I would literally write down like I would say three things. Don't start too big. Consider three things that you eat in your household or three things um, that you use in your household. I wanna say just eat, um, but it could be um, medicinal herbs. They can be culinary herbs. They can be fruits and vegetables. Um, if you wanna go big, I guess you can start with like something legumey. That's kind of a lot. Um, I would start with, you know, like a green might be simple. Um, and put it in something. If you don't have a pot, don't go out and go buy a bunch of stuff before you, you know, get into it. Um, you might not like it and then you might just be throwing away some stuff. So um, get a cup, uh, put some water in it. You know, if you want to start some food scraps, you can do that. Maybe tonight you'll cook dinner and you'll say, hey, like I'm not using the rest of this celery stock. So let's not throw it away. Let's actually see if we can regrow it, put it in some water and, and regrow it. Um, if you don't want to regrow your food scraps from your food, then I, my suggestion is start composting. You can actually start composting um, your items. You can start your own compost or you can start to donate your compostable items to local um, community composting groups. And you can be helping that way. And then as you get more and more into it, you're learning, okay, these are things that I compost. Now I'm reducing my waste. Now what can I grow or how can I turn this compost into food for my soil to then help me to grow more of whatever I want to grow. Um, for my family, we're vegetarian predominantly. So when we had the list of things that we eat, we're like, yes, let's get all of this. Um, so start with where you are, um, consider what you have instead of what you don't have and start where you start where you are. Um, someone in the chat said, if you're, if a rat nibbled on your tomato, broccoli, or kale, would you discard the plant? I would. Um, rats are kind of like those types of pests that can carry diseases and things of that sort. So I just wouldn't chance it. Um, I wouldn't kill the whole plant, but I would definitely discard the, the fruit or the vegetable item. I wouldn't eat it with it. Um, 
Whereas like, I guess, well, I don't know. I would say, I guess you could eat a tomato after, after a worm's eaten it, but most people wouldn't do that either. So yeah, um, I wouldn't suggest it. Uh, rats could possibly get you sick. Um, but if anyone else has any questions, um, feel free to stay on after. Um, and you can call, um, you can email our, uh, I'll add the email address to the chat. Um, it's fatcropssd or fatcrops for San Diego um, at gmail.com. We also have a Facebook page. Um, you can follow this event or the series um, via that Facebook page. You can check it out on San Diego's website as well. Um, and I can also be reached by phone 619-547-6906. Um, you can send a text or if you call, just let me know you attended a workshop and um, I'm always available to talk about um, consultations, um, gardening, growing your own food. Um, if you just have a question, I'm down to talk about it. And if I don't have the answer, I'm always down to look it up because I love to learn. So again, thank you all for joining us here today. Um, Please, if you haven't already, enter your email or send an email to me with your email address if you want to be updated because we're going to transition from a hybrid event to a fully virtual event for the next four workshops um, due to um, increases in COVID um, cases. And we just want to be safe and, you know, try to do our part to so uh, we will be sending out some information and that will also be posted in our Facebook page regarding the change to a fully virtual workshop series. I appreciate you all and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Hi, I have a question. Are you staying after? I'm still here, yes. Okay. Uh, my question, because I was asking about the, 